change Five years ago, after graduating from this campus, my first professional assignment was to design a door the stern door for a combat ship. You see, when I was sitting in your seats, literally, <laughs> never in a million years did I picture myself working for Lockheed Martin, the world's largest aerospace and defense contractor. But life is not always as you plan it. I'd envision myself becoming an architect, designing buildings that generate more energy than they consume, or a university director of sustainability, or the next big urban bike share developer. And then, just before graduation, I was hired into a design team for a large-scale renewable energy system that uses the ocean's temperature differential to drive a turbine. It was happening. I was going to help change the world. And then, I discovered this interesting connection between two seemingly unrelated entities, the military and energy conservation. Let's turn the clocks back a bit so I can give you some context. My mom and dad own a small construction firm focused on unique projects, such as renovating historic houses. Here's a house on wheels that they relocated to avoid demolition and save embodied energy. From their example, I went on to pursue a mechanical engineering degree here, where I was assigned to prove if it was possible to generate solar energy in this city, one of the cloudiest places in the country. Unfortunately, however, passion doesn't always lead to success. You see, I was so passionate about breaking new ground in the energy arena that my senior design team convinced the university to let us dig out your food scraps from the campus dining hall garbage bins to create these hockey puck briquettes as a fuel source in the central heating plant. Turns out, there's the same amount of energy per unit food as there is with the wood chips used today. But by the time we had dried and compressed the food, all of the energy savings were awash. So, Back to the drawing board on that one. Now, raise your hand if you've heard of the Campus Bike Share. Fantastic. I co-founded this program on this mostly hilly and frigid campus. There were many naysayers, but we had the drive to do it, and the program is still running here today, stronger than ever. Here's my younger brother, Shane, who took over the baton when he was studying here. Now, Let's fast forward a bit. Before arriving at the office of my dream job, I decided to take a celebratory bike ride, 4,000 miles across the US, while this beautiful ocean energy harvesting machine waited for me. There it is. And then, in the blink of an eye, my assignment was switched to designing the door. My dreams to help save the world sunk into oblivion, or so it seemed. I thought, what am I doing here? I am going to quit. And where are my sustainability people? I immediately went on a hunt to find them. One day, I drove all the way to the corporate headquarters, and after weaving in and out of the hallways, I discovered the corporate sustainability office, tucked away in the corner, door wide open. It was pretty small, five people for a corporation of 100,000. But no sooner did I arrive, did it all start to make sense, and I convinced them to hire me. I realized that sustainability wasn't just about me or the five of us sitting there in that small room. It was about my company, my country, my species. It's about you and me, right here, right now. Sustainability shouldn't be a movement. It should be obvious. 
but instead it's compartmentalized. It's somebody else's job, somebody else's company, somebody else's country. By the way, when I say sustainability, I'm not talking about just recycling your water bottles or buying organic bananas. I'm talking about using global resources wisely, understanding the long-term impacts of our products on society, designing energy-efficient operations, and just doing more with less. Now, if you had to guess which industry could move the needle the most here, aerospace and defense probably wouldn't be your first guess. And it sure wasn't mine. But then I realized something. At the rate that we're growing as a population and as consumers, we all have a role to play, including the military. And they're actually well positioned for it. Their business is survival. Teddy Roosevelt noted that he considered the US Navy an important force for stability, calling it a potent factor for peace. War may be the greatest waste of human and natural resources that society has ever encountered. Therefore, preventing war may be one of the greatest conservation measures. And that's what a strong military can do. In that sense, the Department of Defense is literally the Department of Conservation. With this new perspective on the Department of Defense, or the DOD, I'd found new meaning and identified an opportunity. Today, the DOD is the single largest consumer of energy on the planet. And because of their energy-intensive activities, it's one of the greatest arenas for sustainable energy deployment and resource conservation. So how much energy are we actually talking here? $16.7 billion worth. That's the DOD's annual energy bill. $16.7 billion, which means there's lots of opportunity. I began to bring my sustainability lens to the table, starting small, digging back to my days of hockey puck briquettes and campus bike shares. I thought, what if our ships were equipped with LED light bulbs? If energy dashboards alerted the captains of instantaneous fuel economy? if we tapped into the waste heat from the generators and tapped into fuel cells, what else could we do? In combat, one out of every 25 military convoys is deliberately destroyed while either delivering or guarding fuel. Energy is an obvious target because it's our life blood. Think about it. The more efficient our field operations are, the less energy we need. Therefore, the fewer convoys we need. Therefore, the fewer human casualties amongst the people running these convoys. Often, we're using fuel to fight for fuel. It's a resource in high demand. And we know that we have limited resources on this ever-growing planet. There's about 350,000 births daily, worldwide. That's eight Binghamtons. <laughs> and I got to tell you this, and I know it might be hard, but if everyone walks out of this room and doesn't change, we have a major problem. Our energy situation could be very dicey in the next few decades. For example, we've got about 150 years left of coal, according to the World's Coal Association, but coal is relatively dirty. Worse, we've got only about 50 years left of natural gas, and in the past 
20 years, the price of natural gas has dropped by about 75%. Great, right? No. Because of this, we are lulled into the sense that it's going to last forever. But that will not be the case. The real question is this. We need to rethink how we use energy within and outside of the defense industry. What does that mean for you? It means that you are going to have to conserve more for the benefit of future generations and for the sustainment of humanity. Here's an idea. Instead of making the human race extinct, let's make the word sustainability extinct. I envision a world where this word becomes redundant because it is so embedded into the way that we operate as a society, the status quo. Just make it a non-issue. In other words, unless we make the word sustainability extinct, we ourselves will become extinct. I realized that sustainability was something that anyone can go after, regardless of industry. The major oil companies are focusing their research and development on renewable energy. Look at what Apple's doing. They're becoming their own utility because they're generating so much of their own power. And the Air Force in the US is the third largest investor of renewable energy in the world and the first largest purchaser of renewable energy in the United States because they know that they will need other sources of fuel to survive in the future. Recently, I transitioned from the corporate sustainability office and created a new role focused exclusively on energy conservation within our own four walls, inside our own operations, in an industry that uses a lot of energy. For example, I've led two large solar projects with several more on the docket. I'm researching the use of artificial intelligence in our buildings to smarten them up so that they can react instantaneously to the weather patterns outside, the utility rates, the manufacturing activities, and much more. We're using batteries to help stabilize the load to the grid so that the utilities don't have to power up another plant when we all go home and turn on the TV. OK, so what? What does all of this mean? I want you to know one thing. What you do matters. What you do matters. When someone asks you to design a door, a door that you didn't sign up to design, what will you do about it? The extinction of sustainability is my mission. You, you'll have your own mission, your own way to make the world a better place. We need you to make the world a better place. Go find those doors and open them, even if they don't seem obvious. And if you don't like what you see, and don't feel like you can change it from where you are, do something about it. Go change the world. Don't wait on the world to change. We can't keep waiting, waiting, waiting on the world to change. Can't keep waiting, waiting, waiting on the world to change. Thank you. Wow, that was really great. So, Devin, you talk about this very interesting world. Uh, one in which the word sustainability is so integrated into our culture that it becomes redundant. Mm. What exactly does that world look like? Hmm. That's a loaded question, really. There are so many avenues and so many aspects, but I'll give a couple examples. And this redundancy aspect, it's, it's almost like saying water is wet. 
Like, I want to put myself out of business. There will be no corporate sustainability office in the future because that role will be absorbed by humanity. It will just be natural habit to do more with less. And specifically, if we talk about buildings, I talked about artificial intelligence. Think about passive houses that don't need supplemental heating and air conditioning. Think about automation, where something is never on when not in use. We don't have to rely on humans to turn things off. And we don't have to rely on incentives to pencil out renewable energy business cases because the technology will have advanced. It's things like that that will progress us to the sustainability is redundant, the sustainability is extinct era, and what do we get when that happens? Well, we get cleaner air, we have capital that's freed up to use in other arenas, we have this thought about designing for cradle to cradle versus cradle to grave, and it's a, a more circular economy versus a linear, linear economy. And one of my favorite architects, Bill McDonough, he calls this concept waste equals food because waste from one process is the input to another. Thank you. Let's give Devin one more round of applause. Thank you.